Here we go. Broadcasting from the Business Radio X studio in Alpharetta, it's time for Profit Sense with Bill McDermott. Good afternoon. Welcome to Profit Sense. This podcast dives into the stories behind some of Atlanta's successful businesses and business owners and the professionals that advise them. We help local business leaders get the word out about the important work they're doing to serve their market, their community, and their profession, as well as discuss current issues that business owners are facing today across a wide variety of industries. I'm your host, Bill McDermott, and this show is presented by The Profitability Coach. When business owners want to increase their profitability, they often don't have the expertise to know where to start or what to do. I leverage my knowledge and relationships from 32 years in banking to identify the hurdles getting in the way and create a plan to deliver profitability they never thought possible. We have two great guests on the show today. Um, We have Barry... Adams with Peachtree Awnings. Barry, welcome. Glad to have you. Thanks, Bill. It's nice to be here today. And we have Marika Ponton with Office Angels. Marika, welcome to Profit Sense. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Barry, I'm going to start with you. You know, um, I looked at your website. Uh, I see in the comments uh, exceptional customer service, great customer service. And, and so I also loved on your website, uh, your inspiration for starting the business was to make people smile. So exceptional customer service, making people smile. Talk about that. Well, you know, Bill, it's um, from the very start. Uh, if you have happy customers, then you're going to be able to replicate that uh, as a business model and bring customers back time after time after time. So um making people smile is something that is kind of in the forefront of everything that we do every day. And our, our uh, product lends itself to uh, being on the outside of your home, outside of a building. And so when you look up and you see something that beautifies your home or uh, office space, then uh, if it brings a smile to your face, then we've done our job. We've, we've done something that, uh, that helps you, uh, represent your business to uh to to the outside community or your or or make your home a, a better place to live so. that's such an excellent point and uh you know it's atlanta it's hot <laughs> it's humid you know everybody needs a canopy or an awning to get some shade here in atlanta georgia we sell shade so <laughs> we cover you up so uh, that's it yeah. i love it and uh you know except exceptional customer service really is a function of, of great people. And so that kind of leads us into talking about uh, employee and associate retention. Um, how do you continue uh, to develop that exceptional customer service? Uh, and how, I, you know, I guess part of that would be in how you retain and uh, uh, associates and employees. Well, I think uh, you have to, kind of take the mold and break it first of all because uh what people are looking for today is a lot different from what people were looking from uh, a, a decade ago and so uh little things uh for us uh, every team member has got uh, a picture uh their picture on our on our uh wall in our office and that starts um uh, with uh um, welcome, welcoming them as a team member and making them feel engaged and uh associate we call people in our company associates rather than employees, but associate engagement is a, a, a very a tricky and nebulous thing. But uh, if you can find the hot buttons that, uh, that um, keep people uh, um, at a high, high level at their energy at a high level, then you can start to uh, really tap into, to their, their lifeblood. And so whether it's, um, you know, going to a Gwinnett Stripers game or, uh, you know, putting their picture on the wall or, or a company picnic or, uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, keeping people really in the fold is what we re- really try to do every day. Not, not easy, not easy. You yeah, know? It's- We're all busy. So, uh, you have to really s- spend that extra 2%, 3% to, to, to k- keep people, keep people at a hot, very high level. Yeah. And, uh, 
not only employee engagement, but also from what I understand, uh, employee fulfillment uh, is a really big part of retention as well. So uh, it sounds to me like part of your strategy is also to figure out uh, what that person's, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, what their currency is, maybe uh, things that they really believe in, whether it's the Cancer Society or rescuing animals. And uh, people like to feel like they're a part of, of purposes or causes that uh, also drive them. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And uh, our workplace today is it's a multiracial, multinational uh, workplace. And so you might hear several different languages spoken on our shop floor and that's you know, tricky to sure, say the, to sure. say, to say the, to say the least. And so even things like, um, our associate evaluations are, are, are in two language are in Spanish and in English so that people are certain that they understand, uh, an evaluation when they're, when it's given to them by their, a manager or supervisor. And so we, we present that type of collateral literature and those processes. Now we've provided them, tried to provide them, uh, um, bilingually. And sure, so that's, sure. that's very, very important. And certainly coming from Gwinnett County myself, I know, uh, Gwinnett and, and other areas of Atlanta certainly have, uh, uh, multicultural multi-languages. I know my, my wife was a preschool director at our church preschool and they actually spoke, I think she told me at one time, 23 different languages, wow. if you can believe it. So, yeah, being able to provide those uh, uh, that information in, in the native tongue of the person is, is absolutely critical. Yeah. So, um, exceptional service, how you uh, attract and retain employees, uh, that really then takes me back to uh, how you as a business owner recruit uh, and select your people. So I don't want you to give away any secret sauce. No, uh, no, 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 but, it's all, it's but what's all your good. secret? Um, well, uh, I think if you go back a decade or so, um, the trades and I use the trades, uh, to represent our business as well. The trades were not in vogue. It was not a sexy thing to be a welder, you know, or, or an installation technician. Um, but now suddenly in, in, 2023, uh, it's becoming uh, more vogue to be in a, in a, in a trade because the trades are paying, or, you know, the paying quite well, and the sure. compensation is good. If you're a welder these days, you're going to be you're going to be in good shape. So, um, one of the things we try to do was to uh, forge strategic relationships with with the trade schools. We're only ten minutes from. Gwinnett Tech. Ah, you know, okay. our shop is only 10 mi minutes from Gwinnett Tech. And I also own Tennessee awnings in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and they mm -hmm. have a, a vocational or trade school called TCAT, which is Tennessee College of Applied Technology. And so we've tried to forge strategic relationships with those institutions so that we create a pipeline of people uh, coming right out of the trade school and, and we get them literally hot off the press, right? Right off the right off the line. And, and so if you've got welding skills and, and you're, you're in the process of finishing, we really want to reach into that trade school and get you before you've, uh, before you've graduated. Sure. And so, um, but in that way, it, it, we don't, we don't have a, a thousand employees, but we, 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 we always need one, two, um, good, good trade technicians. And so whether it's, um, uh, welding or project management, construction management or installation technicians, uh, we can, we can find those, but you really, uh, and I, I told, um, my HR manager, you, when you, when you build these relationships with an institution like Gwinnett Tech, you can't be one and done. You got to show up all the time. You know, if they have a job fair, you, you can't just be a fair weather friend. You have right. to be there all the time because they're in the business of placing their students. They're in the business of, of finding 
uh, jobs for their students. And so uh, we help assist that and create that pipeline for people coming out of their technical school uh, into Peachtree Awnings. And it's it's really, really, um, it took, took a little time, you know, sure. it took a little time. But like any relationship, um, you know, you'll get out of it what you put into it. And I feel like, um, you know, what we get out, we'll get from Gwinnett Tech is, you know, a times 10 uh, kind of relationship. So it's been really, really awesome. Yeah. I, I absolutely love your thinking there. And of course uh, I went through, I think a, a phase uh, not only as a uh, college person myself, but also uh, uh, our children, we tended to think that a college degree uh, was an end all be all, you know, you had to go to college. Uh, and I do think your point, uh, the trades have suffered uh, because of it. And so those that, uh, you know, college is expensive. Yeah. It's not for everybody. And uh, there is good money to be made, whether you're a welder or a plumber or, you know, any of the trades that, uh, you know, that that are offered in the in the metro Atlanta area. It's coming back. So the pendulum, you know, tends to take, uh, you know, 10 year swings. And so it was out and it's coming, coming back in and it, it feels good. It feels right because we need people to do those jobs and do them particularly well, because Absolutely. Uh, if you've ever, if your AC has ever been down and, you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, and you, you need a, a good HVAC company, you know, finding somebody, you know, uh, online is, is, is a good thing. If, as long as you can get somebody out to your house. Yeah. So, yeah. That, you know. uh, that is a challenge, <laughs> yeah. especially yeah. in the summer right. in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know you and I have uh, talked about books that have really impacted us. And that takes us, I think, to a book that I believe you and I chatted about called extreme ownership. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, for our listening audience, uh, tell tell us a little bit about uh, the book as you read it and how it has impacted uh, you and your business. Well, Jocko Willink and Leif Babbitt uh, have a great story to tell because they were all obviously in the very front line um, in Armadi and in some really, really dangerous places. And um and hats off to uh, anybody who's served our country and pr- has helped to protect the freedoms that we enjoy here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, beyond that, they they talk about a level of accountability um, that, uh, you know, no excuses, but it's beyond no excuses. It's, it's, um, starts with if, if, if the team has failed its mission, uh, it starts with leadership, you know, and it starts with leadership. And, um, I don't look for people to blame. Uh, first thing I ask is what, what did I not provide? What did I not provide our folks that they really, really needed to be successful in, in their, their mission or their project? You know, mm-hmm. was it tools? Was it training? Uh, did they not understand, uh, what the, what the mission was? And so, uh, extreme ownership always reflects back on, uh, good leadership. And if, uh, if, if the leader is strong, then the team is strong. And if the uh, leader is strong, probably the communication is good, you know, and, and the understanding is good because the communication is good. And so it pr- tends to permeate from the top down and, and uh, the level of accountability that's required in, in extreme ownership is really something that a lot of people are really kind of uncomfortable with really yeah. honestly and uh and you know we, we we all like to play the blame game you know who, who who's a who's at fault when something goes wrong you know who can who can we you know it's it's not about that if 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 um if the team failed then the team failed and it it seems kind of trite but there is no i in team and so uh we we collectively we take the credit and to let, collectively we take the blame and yeah. i i think uh for me as a business owner that b- begins and ends there uh, because the buck stops with me. And I was having a conversation with a general contractor on the way over and he's trying to get a project done and, and he, he's up in Tennessee, but the, the buck begins and ends with me. And, and so uh, I have to make sure that my team is acutely aware of, of what it takes to accomplish the mission at hand. And if it doesn't, then I have to go back to the drawing board, and say, what did I not do 
to uh, cause them to understand or cause them to uh, be able to complete their, their, their mission in a timely manner or, or fully. So. Yeah, I'm finding as I've coached business owners, uh, accountability is a, is a really big thing. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to see the problem. Uh, but accountability really starts when you own the problem to what you were talking about, extreme ownership. Uh, obviously, once you own it, you solve it, then you do the solution. Um, but it is a challenge uh, sometimes for people to own a problem. And a lot of times leadership doesn't either have accountability in a particular seat uh, or maybe they have two people in the same seat and each person thinks the other one's accountable for it. And so accountability is uh, is is critical to get the results you're looking for. It's a little counterintuitive to uh, understand or realize that the more um, the more power you give up, the more you get better the more power you have yeah. really. And, and uh, a lot of people don't really understand that dynamic uh, because they're, they're always looking to, but if I'm casting blame, then I don't really have control over my own processes or my own people. Do I, if I'm, you know, if I'm casting some, throwing somebody under the bus, then that means that I don't have control over my people or my processes. Yep. And so I look, I'm perceived as powerless. Uh, whether that's true or not, I'm perceived as powerless. And so really raising your hand and saying, uh, Mr. Miss customer, that's, that's on me. That's on me. I take response. I take full, uh, responsibility for that. And, um, the good news is that when the team does accomplish, uh, their mission or the project, um, you can celebrate those times and you should take time to celebrate those times. And a lot of times we miss, miss that as an opportunity, um, because we're off to the next thing. We're all very busy people. And we yep. t- stop to take a moment. Again, we talk about engagement, you know, ta- stop to take a moment to celebrate, uh, those wins with your team and, 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 in a, it just in a meaningful way. And, uh, that's, um, easy to say, hard to do. And, but if you if you can do that with your folks, they really will really appreciate it. It could be, um, just Chick-fil-A biscuits, you know, and the, oh, you yeah. know, in the, in the, in the, in the morning, or it could be, you know, it could be a, a, a cake or, or pizzas for lunch, you know, yep. what have you. So yeah. Yeah. That, that's really important as two, well. Two of my favorite things, Barry, Chick-fil-A yeah. and pizza. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're, uh, we're talking today with uh, Barry Adams, who's the founder and owner of Peachtree Awnings and Peachtree Powder Coating, located in Lawrenceville. Uh, Peachtree Awnings is a premier manufacturer of custom commercial and residential canopies of all kinds. Their clients include some of the largest companies in Atlanta, general contractors, and property managers. Um, Barry, to kind of close out, um, the baby boomer generation is thinking about succession planning. Uh, Succession planning is something that business owners think about but seem to have a hard time implementing. So when you think about succession planning uh, for the business owner, uh, what comes to mind? And and you certainly are very experienced uh, as a business owner yourself. What do you think maybe are the pain points uh, that business owners need to be alert to? Well, first of all, I would say uh, get started as early as you can. Give yourself the longest runway that you can to be successful in that business transition. Uh, it's not too early. You might think, oh, it's, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 59. This is way too early to get started in that process. It's not. You know, give yourself the longest runway possible because uh, the people that you're going to need to pull into that process to advise you um, need to know what's on your mind and what your intentions are. And so um, not everybody has uh, a son, a daughter, a family member to pass that business along to. Uh, it would be nice to think so. I don't have a, a son or daughter involved in, in my business. And so... Um, no, no idea is a bad idea. You can look at, uh, you know, an ESOP uh, employee stock ownership program. You sure. can sell it to, to one of your, uh, one of your key employees or, a, a, a key person in your company. Uh, you could sell it to, um, um, an unrelated, uh, a disinterested third party. Um, 
but uh, you really have to uh, be very open-minded, I think, about w- uh, where uh, that next business owner, where that, where that person is going to come from, and, uh, and identifying a number of strategies and then, and then selecting the, the, proper, the proper strategy for you and giving, giving yourself a long time to develop those strategies and not uh, settling on one thing or not having to do it in a, in, in a crisis mode or in a short period of time. Uh, where where time becomes your enemy, because right now for me time is my friend. Uh, I'm I'm healthy. Um, I feel like a fairly young sixty one, but that th- 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 some some mornings I might disagree with that. Yeah, uh, I would have guessed younger, but go but, ahead. But 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 uh, <laughs> at any rate, it it, it it's. Um, it's something that I'm starting to think about more and more. The horizon is getting closer, and uh, and so I'm I'm trying to wrestle with those same questions that uh, many business owners do every every single day. Yeah, you had mentioned a uh, a moment ago just uh, bringing in a team. Who do you think is uh, is important to be part of that team that helps you with that with that long runway and helps you with that process? Well. Uh, I would start with your, um, the, your lending institution, whoever, Mm -hmm. whoever your bank, your lending institution is, uh, your accountant, um, someone who can help you with a business valuation, uh, is, is a part of that team might be an attorney, might be a key attorney that you've consulted with. Um, so those are four people right, right off the top of my, you know, top of my head that really need to be integrally involved in those discussions and everybody should be kept uh, at the same pace. I would say nobody needs to be kept in the dark. Everybody needs to kind of know what page you are on as a business owner. And that kind of helps, helps that team move together to advise you appropriately. Sure. Sure. So it sounds like long runway, uh, put together your team, uh, possibly a banker, CPA, uh, business valuation advisor, and and maybe also an attorney. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so, Barry, for those of us that maybe need some shade in our yeah. lives, if we someone, hope everybody. <laughs> you know, it's everybody, yeah. especially in Atlanta, Georgia, and probably Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, what is the best way for a contractor or a potential client to get in touch with you and Peachtree Awnings? Well, you went to the website. We appreciate, you know, all the, all the web traffic that we can get. You can, uh, you can drop us a line at info at peachtreeawnings.com, you know, is a great, great way. You go, go to the, uh, website and go to the contact us button and fill out a web page. Those are great ways. Or you can just simply call into the office. We'd love to hear, hear from you. And, uh, and that's a great way. We, 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 you know, we're, our office is staffed fully from, uh, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Wow, great. And that phone number I think I have is 770-409-8372. You got it, Bill. All right. Barry, it's been a delight having you on Profit Sense. Thanks so much for uh, not only sharing your experiences, but your expertise. And uh, 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 I love I love making clients smile. I'm going to try to aspire <laughs> to that in my business, too. Thanks, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And now we're going to talk to Marika Ponton. Marika is the owner of Office Angels. Uh, Marika, it is so exciting to have you on. Um, I'm going to just start out uh, very generally. Uh, Why should a business owner call Office Angels? It's a great question. And first of all, I just have to say thank you for having me on, but also Really, I want you to know how much I appreciate all the guests that I've listened to on the podcast and even just sitting here listening to Barry. It's lovely. And it's why Office Angels has been around for 23 years helping small business owners is because of stories like that and just thoughtful people running businesses and we are there to help them. So why should they call call Office Angels? This sounds terrible, but it is totally true when they're in pain. And that pain can be so many things, uh, as small business owners know. Who's going to do this? I don't know how to do this. Um, I don't even know what help I need. Pick up the phone, and number one, we're just fun to chat with, so that would be one reason. Right. But also, let us know what your pain point is. 
Um, the business has been helping small business owners for 23 years with so many different things. We probably have a solution and we can talk you through getting there. Great point. Um, I also um, want to get your perspective on um, maybe there are some things that surprised you the most about small business ownership. Can you name a couple? Uh, where do I start? <laughs> um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of background about myself so it makes more sense. Okay. I spent many years as an auditor in public accounting. Ah. And if anyone knows what that means, that's painful. <laughs> it's also lonely. Exactly. It's you and the numbers. You and the numbers. You and the numbers and probably difficult clients, um, not enough staff, you know, deadlines intense deadlines. And so my point is it was hard and it was challenging sure. and it, it really gave me grit. And here's what I'm going to say about small business ownership. Hardest thing I've ever done. Literally hardest thing I've ever done. I was blown away at just my frustrations and what I wasn't able to accomplish that I probably thought I could have easily and so that's the surprise is how hard it was and how much help you really do need. And it's also lonely as well. You know, where do you go? Who do you talk to? Like I said, call office angels. We're there. Right. Um, but truly challenging. Um, and before office angels, I owned a flooring company. So that's why so many things Barry was saying. I identified with, you know, the labor shortages, getting people to, um, you know, show up and to work. All of those things were on me. And I guess that's really the crux of it is that the owner is where the buck stops and you need that team around you. But who is that team and how do you get them and how do you find them and how do you trust them? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of my story was, uh, I really thought starting the business, I had to be all things to all people. Absolutely. And, uh, and so I became, uh, the choke point of my own business. And, uh, I was, uh, unintentionally paying my own hourly rate to do tasks that I wasn't good at and could be done well by a very competent person that, I could pay less than my hourly rate and free up time. And so part of that was my realization uh, as kind of a solopreneur, you know, you play to your strengths and you staff your weaknesses. And so I hired someone to handle my calendar, uh, my marketing, two things that I can remember uh, that I really wasn't good at. And it was a game changer. And I was happier, and the person that was doing that work was great at it. Mm -hmm. And so it was a it was a win win. It's an absolute win win, and the business can grow. Yeah, because you're not that choke point, and that is my entire mission with Office Angels is to grow and help more business owners. But if I'm doing all of those tasks that are non critical for me to do, no way. Yeah. You can't grow. You can't. Um, so that's really was just mind boggling for me when I first started in small business ownership. You can't do everything. Yeah. You yeah. know, so you true. really can't. We're talking today with Marika Ponton, who is the owner of Office Angels. Uh, combine an in depth accounting background of a CPA, an outgoing personality of a business development professional, and an unwavering drive to help. Small business owners and entrepreneurs grow and command their businesses to achieve their goals. And you have Marie Caponton. And so I want to ask you a little bit about uh, some of the most influential people in your life and how they impacted you. It's such a good question. Thank you for asking. Um, and there's a few. And I'll start with all the way back something so special that I can remember that still affects me to this day. I was probably eight years old. I was on my grandfather's farm and he said, Hey, go ahead and um, jump up on that forklift and, you know, go move that box over there. Okay. So, and he'd shown me some things. It wasn't just like complete child unsafety. Um, but when I did that, 
I totally rammed the forks into the side of the box. Uh oh. Right. And so all these, you know, walnuts start for, p- pouring out. And I'm looking around like, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble because if it was my parents around, I would have been. But what did my grandfather say to me? He said, that's okay. That's how you learn. And to this day, I still think about that because it really shaped my entire life of like, it's okay if I make a mistake. I don't have to be hung up on that forever and beat myself up. I learn from it and I don't do it again, but I roll on, you know, just like I did with that forklift. Um, so that one really stuck with me. And the next one, um, a few years later, my dad, um, we were driving in Utah in the, in the, in the deserts of Utah and I was about 10 and he said, Hey, let me teach you how to drive. And I jumped behind the wheel and he taught me again, there's a lot of child unsafety sounding like this was was back in the, back in the day. It was fine. Right. But what I, what that really taught me was it was just, he pushed me and he made me do things that I really didn't think I could do. And I did. Um, and also with my dad, this is a good story. Um, my name is spelled M A R I K A, but that's not how it originally was. It was originally with a C and everyone would call me Marsha. Ah, yes. Okay. And which is fine. That's a fine name. But it was Marika. And my both of my parents, I will give them both credit for this. They said, you need to explain to people how to pronounce your name. And so any of you who know me now, I don't shy away from ever speaking up and sticking up for myself and having confidence about who I am and what I do. And that came from my parents. And they, my dad even went to the extent of going down and having my name changed on my birth certificate to a K. And so my point here is stick up for yourself. It's okay to speak up and correct someone if it's not, you know, what you want to be known as or in whatever it is in life. It's okay to speak up. Yeah. yeah. The, the the thought that comes to mind, if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. Absolutely. Is it yeah. a country song? Or? Yeah, it could be. You know, <laughs> I think I, it might be. I don't yeah. know the singer, but maybe. Me neither, but it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. So... Um, a lot of businesses are getting agile. Uh, in your experience, what are two specific things that small businesses can do to get agile? I'm going to speak right to what you do for a living. It is get your books in order, timely and accurate, and know where your profitability points are and how you can improve. I, I can't speak to it enough. Having proper books is just the first thing I ask of anyone that I'm talking to in a business relationship. Uh, When they're asking for help, what can I do to turn this around? Where where am I missing? Well, where's your financials? What's fine? What financials? You know, or, oh, well, they're not cut up from, you know, 22. Start there and then come talk to me. Um, And a lot of that comes from my, I mean, I'm a CPA. Like the, the background is we got to have the numbers, you know, and, and an auditor, but in small business, um, if you don't have books, I don't know. I don't know how you do much of anything with security because you're making decisions totally blind of not knowing if you can even afford something, if you should be doing this, if this, this is the right decision. So that's number one in my book. And I know it's your book as well. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir. Exactly. Here. But I had to say, because I literally live it. Yeah. I live it. Yeah. It is so crucial. When I was a flooring business owner, so many of the other franchisees would come to me because, you know, I was profitable and I was having all these sales and they're like, well, what do you do? You know, what, tell me how to be like you. Well, I mean, no one can be Marika, but um, what I can tell you is, how do your financials look? What dig into your financials? I'm happy to look at them. And I did. And I would just glaringly see things. Hey, why are you spending on this when, you know, your sales are down 50% from last month? Ooh, good point. So that's number one. Number one. And number two, I would say is just same things we've been talking about right here is take Take stock of non-critical tasks that you're doing. Take stock, write it down. What are things that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing and aren't the best use of your time and outsource those? And that's 
Office Angels is yeah. there to help you with that. So I had a client who was actually coaching me when I was coaching them. Okay. Uh, she said, Bill, you need to build a this is ridiculous list, meaning this is ridiculous that you're doing this task. Uh, and so the same thing mm-hmm. uh, that you're talking about, make a list. Yep. I shouldn't be do, doing this. Uh, find an office angel to do this for me, exactly. who's, who's much better at it. So, gosh, I'm a walking commercial for you office literally angels. Are. You, I mean, I? that's why I said, why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? I you're mean, here because you're important. I'm fun. I mean, that's really kind of it. That's, well, what yeah. that's what I hang on to. That's what I hang on to. Yeah. So what's been your least favorite job to date and what did you learn from it? You know, I, I spoke about public accounting. No, I'm kidding. Um, you, <laughs> we won't go there. I've got a funny one. I've got a funny one, even though it wasn't funny at the time. It was one of my first jobs way back. Um, and I won't even name the company. I won't, I won't do that. But it was, um, they made smoothies. And so I show up for my, I'm super excited. It's like my first job. I show up and they give me a hat that has the brand on it, right? I'm ready to rock the brand. And I go to put the hat on and it is literally stained with sweat in the hat. Oh my gosh. And it's just like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm like not valued to even get a brand new hat, right? And of course, I was already at that point where I'm speaking up for myself. And I said, hey, can I get a new hat? This is kind of gross. And they were like, no, this is all we have. So I I did wear it. Um, but because I had spoken up, they went ahead and put me in the freezer, lifting strawberries and berries and all of this stuff for the entire day. And look, I, I say it's funny because... It was really, it was, but what it taught me and what I remembered, and it's some of what, you know, Barry was speaking to how you treat employees and onboard people and show them how you care about them as a, anytime, but really as a first impression, it stuck with me. You gave me a a used hat, yeah. you know, in a food space, like this is unacceptable right unacceptable and it but it stuck with me it's a good story because it's like i'll never do that i I may not be perfect on how we onboard and how we engage but i care and i'm thoughtful and i will try so that was the least favorite job yeah understandable yep so i know you and i both love to read uh we're lifelong learners so what is one book you would recommend to the audience and then the second part of that is why would yeah, you recommend Yeah, it? and it's such a great, we're having, this is such a good conversation here today because it all aligns. The book that I um, really would encourage people to pick up, and even if they are challenged with some of the, it, it's a slow read because it's it's heavy, but what it's called is The Courage to Be Disliked. Mm. And it's exactly along the lines of some of the stuff you guys were talking about with Jocko and the extreme ownership. It's all about accepting responsibility for your circumstances and not being a victim. And you can change it if you dig in. It's no one else's responsibility to fix your life or fix your business. Take a look at yourself and really know who you are and know what your skills are and if you're not good at something, that's okay. It's, it's, it's more power really to you. If you can say, I can't do this. I'm terrible because move that to somebody else who's better at it. And then we grow the business or we grow our life or we, you know, we become happier in our lives. So the courage to be disliked, um, like I said, it's, it, it's, it was tough even for me to get through because it's so thought provoking. Uh, I had to put it down and say, you know, let me, I got to let that sink in for just a minute. Um, but why, why do I recommend it? All those things. But so much that I hear when people are looking for help, it's just as discussed earlier, they're oftentimes looking to blame someone else before they go, hey, maybe I messed that up, you know? And that's where really knowing yourself and being okay with doing things, even though not everybody likes them, 
that courage to be disliked, it's, it's powerful. Yeah. It's really powerful. <laughs> and it really, it, it can drive you to a deeper level of happiness with yourself and your business. Yeah. Sounds like a, a great book. It's a great book, but get, don't give up on it is my point. Don't give up. Cause I've recommended it to multiple people and they're like, Whoa. And I'm like, I know, put it down, <laughs> come back after you've thought about it, but don't give up on it. Yeah. 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 So for our listening audience out there, somebody needs an office angel. What's the best way for them to get in touch with uh, you and or the firm? Call us up. We love to chat. We absolutely love to chat. We want to hear your story. The phone number is 678-528-0500 or go to our website. Have it really. That's the same kind of thing. Contact form. Learn a little bit about us. It is officeangels.us. Great. Marie, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me, Bill. You know, I want to take a moment and talk about the sales rule everyone should follow. When someone mentions they're a salesperson, mental inf- images often come to mind of the used car salesperson that asks, What do I need to do to get you in the car today? People hate to be sold, but when people are ready to buy, they appreciate the help. There's a subtle mind shift. uh, Excuse me. There's a subtle mindset shift, sell versus help. The used car salesperson makes it about themselves, but the smart salesperson makes it about their client. One of the best pieces of sales advice I've gotten is the level of activity you're willing to do adopt will be a limiting factor in your business. If I adopt a low activity process, I'll have low production. But if I'm willing to adopt a high level activity, I will have high production. Having spent over four decades in sales, I've learned the 10-3-1 rule. For every 10 client meetings I have, I'll give three proposals. And for every three proposals, I'll get one sale. So early on in my career, I looked at my calendar and saw five potential time slots for meetings, 8 a.m. breakfast, 10 a.m., noon for lunch, 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. So if I challenge myself to fill three of those five slots every day, that's 60 potential client meetings per month, 18 proposals, and six sales. If my sales goal was $200,000, then each sale needed to be at least 34000 which is the 200000 divided by six. If I'm able to make four appointments per day, that's 80 calls, 24 proposals, and eight sales. With the same average sale, I make 272000 If I adopt only two calls per day, that's 40 calls a month, 12 proposals, and four sales. That's 136000 I miss my sales goal by 32%. The combination of a mindset of helping people buy, combined with a high-activity 1031 process, put you well on your way to being a top salesperson in your organization. If you want to keep up with the latest in pro business news, follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram at the profitability coach. If you want to listen to past or future profit sense episodes, you can find us on profit This is profit sense with bill McDermott signing off. Make it a great day.